Hi folks, my name is Cole, and today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at malaria vaccine development, and in particular how antibodies slow red blood cell invasion. So stick with me till the end of the video to figure out how the scientists identified this really interesting information. I also want to give a quick acknowledgement to the fact that today is World Malaria Day, and World Malaria Day highlights the collective energy and commitment of the global malaria community in uniting around the common goal of a world free of malaria, which is absolutely stupendous because malaria has been a scourge on humanity for millennia and not only the disease, but also their vectors. Mosquitoes are hands down one of the worst bugs I've ever encountered, but I digress. Over the past century or so, we've actually done a really good job at limiting the area in which malaria affects. Since 2000, we've also decreased the incidences of it by 29% and the deaths related to malaria by 60%. However, in spite of this progress, worldwide over 229 million people will be infected with malaria each year. And this will result in over 400,000 deaths, primarily in Africa. Not only does malaria affect health, but it also affects wealth. As you can see here, there is a correlation between the percentage of your population that has malaria and a decrease in GDP. So there are multiple incentives to get rid of malaria. Malaria spreads through their mosquito vectors. However, the mosquitoes are not the causative agent of malaria. Malaria infections are a result of a parasitic infection with the parasite Plasmodium. And the two most common Plasmodium species to infect humans are Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax with Plasmodium falciparum accounting for the majority of deadly or life-threatening infections in humans. When you get infected with malaria, there are many common symptoms, such as headaches, nausea, vomiting, splenomegaly, chills, fatigue, and a dry cough. And this is due to the parasites replicating in your body. Now, when you first get infected from a mosquito bite, nothing really happens because the plasmodium is immediately going to your liver where it starts to replicate. Once it replicates to a high enough level in the liver, it exits in the form of merozoites and starts to continually infect red blood cells. This infection of red blood cells happens until the parasite is all over the body. And this is when you start experiencing symptoms. And in the mosquito vector, the parasite undergoes sexual reproduction to start the whole infection cycle in humans over again. Now, as it stands, we do have many powerful and cost-effective malaria prevention tools, such as mosquito nets, uh, insecticides, and prophylactic treatment of vulnerable groups, such as pregnant women and children. However, these effective control measures are expensive to maintain and are threatened by the emergence of resistance. This is why an effective anti-malaria vaccine is required. And when thinking about anti-malaria vaccines, there are a few regions in the plasmodium life cycle that can be targeted. As it stands, there are many vaccines in clinical trials. However, the one that we're focusing on today focuses on inhibiting merozoite infection. It does this by targeting the Rh5 protein. And the Rh5 protein on the outside of merozoites is critical for interacting with the red blood cell receptor basogen. Upon interacting, this induces a tight junction formation, which progresses into the creation of a parasitophorous vacuole, which allows the merozoite to then infect and invade red blood cells. Now, our body has its own defense system against pathogens in the form of our immune system. And when we talk about long lasting immunity, we're primarily talking about the adaptive immune response. And the adaptive immune response is primarily mediated by B cells and T cells. And when B cells get activated, they differentiate into two major subtypes. They differentiate into plasma blasts, also known as plasmacytes or plasma cells, which secrete antibodies which bind to these antigens. The second differentiation is memory B cells, which creates a long lasting cell type, which allows for rapid effective responses against seeing the same antigen again. Antibodies that these plasmoblasts are secreting are basically our own sort of defensive puzzle pieces. 
which bind to the antigen. And they bind to the antigen through their variable regions at the tip. And antibodies don't bind to full antigens. They bind to particular parts on these molecular proteins. And these parts where the antibodies bind together are called epitopes. So upon antibody binding to antigen epitopes, they can mediate many different functions, such as opsonization or direct neutralization of these antigens. What we're focusing on today is how antibodies are binding to this Plasmodium falciparum RH5 protein, or PFRH5. Now, before jumping directly into the paper, I want to highlight why this is important to look at. This is important to look at because as it stands, we don't have an effective anti-malaria vaccine available to us. This is due in part to the difficulty in targeting the Plasmodium parasites because of their multiple different life stages in the body. They don't have the same antigen presented all the time. So by investigating this, we can learn about how antibodies interact with parasite receptors to create effective vaccines. So the paper that we're highlighting today is called Human Antibodies That Slow Erythrocyte Invasion Potentiate Malaria Neutralizing Antibodies by Alanine et al. from the University of Oxford, Oxford, UK. And in this paper, they look at the effectiveness of multiple antibodies generated against RH5 protein. They do this by vaccinating volunteers or with a vaccine that utilizes the PFRH5 protein. Once vaccinated, these people have their plasmablasts isolated, and from their plasmablasts, they further have the specific antibodies isolated. These antibodies have their variable regions transferred onto IgG antibodies, which allows the researchers to study them effectively and look at their binding against RH5 protein. So this is important to note because by blocking this interaction, you can inhibit growth. So to see the effect of these antibodies, the authors of this paper set up a growth assay and they found that some of these antibodies were more effective than others. When finding these effective antibodies, they isolated them and tested them against the most common PFRH5 polymorphisms to see how well they inhibit merozoite growth. After doing this, they next grouped these antibodies according to where they bind on PFRH5 and how well they bind PFRH5. So you can see the groupings here. What is particularly interesting to note though, is that the red, blue, and olive groups particularly correlate well with how well these antibodies function as neutralizing antibodies. And after identifying how well they bind and how effective they are blocking merozoite growth, they also look to see where else these antibodies are binding in these protein complexes. They looked at these antibodies and their ability to bind to the CYRPA receptor and found that some of these antibodies also bind that. They also found that some of these antibodies also bind to uh, basogen and of particular note in these red and green groups, these antibodies bind all three, RH5, basogen, and CYRPA, which is really interesting. After identifying what these antibodies can bind, they then looked at identifying the key epitope binding sites of these antibodies on PFRH5. So when testing the most effective groups, the red and the blue groups, they found that these neutralizing antibodies bound to the N-terminal region of PFRH5, around where basogen interacts. And if we look at it from a different angle, you can specifically see that they are binding different sites. There are some of these antibodies that just don't neutralize merozoite growth very effectively. So the authors of this paper were curious as to what these antibodies were doing. So they tested them in the presence of neutralizing antibodies and found that these non-neutralizing antibodies potentiate or increase the inhibition of neutralizing antibodies. They increase this inhibitory effect of neutralizing antibodies by about tenfold when acting together, which is a lot. So this then drove the authors to ask where these non-neutralizing antibodies were binding to. And you can see the non-neutralizing antibody are binding around the middle of RH5, which is really interesting. And when testing to see how this compares to the neutralizing antibodies, they identified that these antibodies were all binding separate epitopes on RH5. So 
If these antibodies are not neutralizing Rh5, what are they doing? The scientists in this study hypothesized that these non-neutralizing antibodies might be increasing the invasion time required for merozoites to enter red blood cells. So they investigated this. They looked at parasite invasion time and found that plasmodium parasites will infect red blood cells on average about 26 seconds. However, with the addition of this non-neutralizing antibody, this invasion time was increased about three times to around 77 seconds. So in summary, the authors of this paper found antibodies from vaccinated volunteers specific to Rh5 and looked at their ability to inhibit growth by themselves and together and found that when some of these antibodies work together, they have increased inhibitory potential. They also found that this was being mediated by them binding different epitopes of Rh5 to increase the invasion time required to get into red blood cells. This could result in the neutralizing antibodies having more time to bind Rh5 and prevent invasion. Now, this information is really interesting and significantly enhances the malaria vaccine field. It does this in part by broadening our understanding of how antibodies work together in our bodies. What's particularly interesting to know is that there's not actually many examples of antibodies working together like this. So this is extremely new and highlights the importance of selecting the best antibodies to use for future studies and would then help lead us to designing more effective, efficacious vaccine targets. When going through this information, I had a few questions that I thought of as to how this research could be continued. My first question is because this is a relatively new thing of these antibodies working together, how many different forms of infection do we know of that are actually working in this way? How many have non-neutralizing antibodies and neutralizing antibodies working together to enhance our immune responses? Additionally, I mentioned that uh, these antibodies were grouped on their ability to bind and where they bound Rh5 receptor. So how can we reduce redundantly binding epitopes? Is there a way that we can get rid of some of these not as effective antibodies when designing our vaccines? And furthermore, this paper was focused around a phase one clinical trial. So my next question is just how safe is this? How effective is it? And what is the optimal dosing to get a strong, long lasting immune response from this vaccine? It remains to be seen. I also wanted to point out that this group has continued their research since this paper and have come out with some new findings that I encourage you to go look at. My final question though is, what do you think? What sort of thoughts or ideas popped into your head when hearing about this information? Love to hear about them in the comment section below. Ultimately though, I hope that you learned something and more importantly, you enjoyed your time doing so. So if you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. And with that, I will see you next time.